Hi everyone, welcome to Western Civ 2. My name is Ryan P. Johnson, and today we'll be covering the two decades between the end of World War I and the beginning of World War II. For my current students, as always, there's a quiz located in the Interwar Period module in our course LMS. So please access that quiz now if you haven't already. For anyone watching that is not one of my current students, it's great to have you on board. I hope you like what you see and hear in this presentation. Whatever your status, please take a moment to like and share this video and subscribe to my channel. My students have likely had enough time to access the quiz, so on with the show. In this presentation, we'll examine how Russia was faring after the Russian Revolution, the emergence of fascism in Italy, the growth of Nazism in Germany, and finally, we'll take a look at what the democratic nations of Great Britain, France, and the United States were doing between the wars. Let's begin by looking at Russia. If you'll recall, in the previous lesson, we explored the Russian Revolution and how Vladimir Lenin and his followers seized control and dropped out of World War I. The fighting was not over, though, for as soon as Russia left World War I, a civil war broke out that lasted for a few years. Lenin and his allies were collectively known as the Reds, while their enemies were collectively known as the Whites. The Whites included military officers, supporters of the monarchy, and liberals who had been part of the Duma. These groups faced not only each other, but revolts by nationalist groups looking to carve out new states for themselves in the chaos. Although the Reds were greatly outnumbered, they controlled important cities such as Moscow. They were also more organized, as Leon Trotsky rebuilt the army to five million men. The Reds had effectively won the war by 1920, but sporadic resistance and fighting continued for two more years. The terrible violence and ruthlessness demonstrated by both sides left deep scars and lasting resentments throughout Russian society. When the Civil War broke out, the Russian economy came to resemble that of Western nations during the First World War. The most important industries were put under state control, while free trading and capitalism were allowed on a smaller scale. However, as the conflict continued, the economy moved into a state of war communism, meaning a situation in which the government took over more industries, began requisitioning grain from the countryside, ramped up military production, and outlawed private trade. The results of war communism were terrible. Production declined by 80%. Cities like Moscow saw population decline. And famine racked the country, killing as many as 5 million people. These problems led to popular unrest and protest, causing Lenin to change course. In 1921, the Russian economy began a program called the New Economic Policy. In this system, the state controlled heavy industry, finance, and other industries deemed vital. Private ownership of property was allowed, though, as was a limited amount of capitalism. In the rural countryside, peasants were allowed to grow crops for their own benefit. The agricultural sector began to rebound, and production levels had risen to pre-war levels by 1924. However, peasants were largely unwilling to sell much of their produce in urban markets to benefit industrial populations, leading to food shortages. Economic policy was changed once again after the death of Vladimir Lenin in 1924. His successor was Joseph Stalin, a relatively minor party operative who outmaneuvered his rivals, such as Leon Trotsky, in order to take command of the Soviet Union. 
Stalin wanted to speed up industrial production, partly out of fear of falling behind Western nations. In the late 1920s, agricultural prices were decreasing, while industrial prices were increasing. This led to farmers hoarding grain as a means of artificially inflating their prices, but it also led to more famine and starvation, especially in cities. In 1928, Stalin ordered the requisition of grain and began the process of collectivizing agriculture. The process of collectivizing agriculture saw peasants forced to give up their land and move on to huge collective farms, some with as many as 30,000 people. Those living on collective farms were given a common set of tools and other resources to share and use to grow food. There was resistance to this process. Hundreds of revolts took place across the nation, and the military was called in to put them down. Though Stalin slowed down the pace of collectivization, by 1935, nearly the entire agricultural sector had been changed. Alongside forced collectivization was Stalin's desire to ramp up industrial production. In 1928, the first five-year plan was begun. New industries and even new cities were built. The urban population grew, and industrial output increased dramatically. The Soviet government was able to save money on some projects through the use of prison labor, which had the perverse effect of increasing the number of people imprisoned. The Soviet gulag system incarcerated over three and a half million people by the end of the 1930s, and people were arrested for having contact with foreigners or were imprisoned for small crimes. Another problem with the economic system is that production quotas were set by the Communist Party, not the industries or business owners themselves. This led to companies focusing exclusively on quantity not quality. Some shoe producers, in order to meet their state-driven quotas, produced all of their shoes in the same size, for example. Meeting production quotas was the most important thing. It mattered much less whether or not most of the product ended up unsold or on a scrap heap. As long as the company could say they met their quotas, they were good. Women in Russia took many industrial jobs. They made up nearly 40% of the total workforce by the end of the 1940s. And in some specific industries, they made up nearly 70% of the workforce. However, Stalin was adopting a more conservative outlook for Russian society, making divorce and abortion much harder for women to obtain. There was also the expectation that even women who worked should also raise a family and take care of the household. In 1937 and 1938, Stalin initiated a purge of Lenin loyalists now called the Great Terror. Top-ranking party members, military officers, and anyone else Stalin believed to be an enemy were imprisoned or executed. 90% of the officer corps of the Russian military was purged, and between 200,000 and 300,000 peasants were rounded up and shot. This purge gave Stalin the ability to appoint new military leaders and bureaucrats who would be loyal to Stalin and owe their positions to him. The results were one million dead and one and a half million in prison. Despite such depravity, there were some successes during the 1930s. More people were getting an education, reducing illiteracy across the nation by 30%. Free hospitals and government aid helped increase the overall health of the Russian people. However, these gains seem meager amid all of the destruction and chaos those very people witnessed since 1914. If we move west, we see another nation struggling in the wake of the First World War. 
Italy had spent nearly $15 billion on the war, which cost it 700,000 lives. To add insult to injury, Great Britain and France reneged on the promises of territory they had made to get Italy to join their side in the war. Many Italians felt betrayed by nations they considered their allies. War problems were not the only ones plaguing the country. There was a distinct divide between the more modernized and prosperous North and the more rural and poorer South. There was conflict over land, wages for workers, and political power. Strikes were frequent and disrupted social and economic progress. Some Italians turned to socialism for answers. The socialists gained more political power during the 1920s, but became increasingly radical as the decade progressed. Socialist groups took over businesses and tried to break up large farms for redistribution. This activity worried many and provoked a major backlash from the political right. It's in this context that we see the emergence of Benito Mussolini. He was a former school teacher and newspaper editor. When he became more politically active, he originally joined the Socialists, but became pro-war in 1914 and began organizing groups to advocate for Italy to end its neutrality and get involved in the fight. These groups coalesced into a loose organization that came to be known as the Fascists, due to the symbol they employed, an old Roman symbol of an axe with a bundle of sticks surrounding it, meant to signify strength and unity. This symbol is known as a fasces, hence fascists. Initially, the fascists had little real political support, but they did have determination and aggression. Fascist groups took to physically attacking, striking workers and socialists, which some supported as steps to maintain law and order. According to fascist lore, Mussolini and his supporters staged a dramatic march on Rome and seized control of the Italian government. The reality is much more benign. Mussolini had been negotiating for a spot in the Italian government and did manage to organize tens of thousands of his supporters outside of Rome to demonstrate his popular appeal. The King of Italy, Victor Emmanuel III, hoping to co-opt the fascists, welcomed Mussolini into government as his prime minister. As time wore on and democracy in Italy continued to crumble, Mussolini began transforming Italy into a fascist state. There were three main principles of fascism that Mussolini tried to imbue into every part of Italian life. Statism called for the state to be the most important entity, far more important than individuals. If the rights of individuals conflicted with the rights of the state, the state always won. Nationalism called for an intense pride in your country, its history, and its traditions. Fascists invested a great deal of money on art and architecture that highlighted the strength and glory of Italy. Finally, militarism was fundamental to fascist ideology. Fascists believe in always being aggressive and taking what they wanted through force. Mussolini eventually shut down the Italian parliament and outlawed other parties, making Italy a one-party state. He also controlled the press and used it to censor any opposition and build up the reputation of himself and his regime. He and his followers also used violence to intimidate any opposition and cow them into surrender. Mussolini also aligned his government with big business, putting 22 corporations in charge of the economy, while simultaneously appeasing workers through investment in infrastructure projects, offering paid vacations, and implementing social security. 
he also made a deal with the Catholic Church. Catholicism was made the official state religion, and religious education made its way into the education system. In return, the Church agreed to not criticize the regime, its leader, or its actions. To the north, Germany was also going through serious political upheavals. In the days prior to the armistice with the Allies, a revolution spread throughout Germany. The revolutionaries kept most of the administration intact, but wanted to hold elections to choose representatives who would be tasked with creating a constitution. Just as in Italy, the socialist and communist groups pushing this revolution became more radical and sponsored armed uprisings to more quickly accomplish their goals. This radicalism provoked a backlash from those on the right wing of German politics. The Free Corps were composed of military vets and nationalists who were anti-communist, anti-Semitic, and anti-democracy. Despite the new Weimar Republic granting universal suffrage, a Bill of Rights, and guaranteed social protections, an insidious conspiracy theory began to take hold that would help weaken the German government. The stabbed in the back myth said that Germany had not actually lost World War I. Rather, it had been undermined by internal enemies who sought to profit from Germany's defeat. Jewish groups and the Weimar government were the two biggest, quote, culprits, according to this conspiracy theory. It didn't help that notable German politicians, as well as former military leaders, either played up this myth or made statements that inadvertently gave it credence. Belief in this myth became widespread, as the German people sought out explanations for why they lost the war. The conspiracy theory added to the list of things many people in Germany were upset about. The Treaty of Versailles, with its clause blaming Germany for the war, was very unpopular. Many also resented the reparations payments Germany had to make to France and Belgium for the destruction caused by the war. When Germany failed to make a reparations payment to France, the French army moved into a valuable industrial area of Germany and occupied it as punishment, which also irritated the German people. As a means of trying to pay the reparations, Germany simply began printing more money, leading to tremendous inflation that wiped out savings and caused the price of a pound of potatoes to increase to 40 million German marks in late 1923. For the German people, there was much to be worried and angry about. The mid and late 1920s saw steps taken to try and alleviate some of the aforementioned ills. In 1924, the Dawes Plan was introduced by an American-led committee to reschedule Germany's payments, making it easier for Germany to meet its financial obligations. The United States also loaned Germany hundreds of millions of dollars as a means of kickstarting their economy. New French leadership also led to an easing of tensions between the two nations, and an agreement to work together to mutually ensure the provisions of the Treaty of Versailles were enforced. The German economy in the mid-1920s seemed to be stabilizing, and even improving. Local governments began public works programs to build schools and hospitals. However, much of the hard work that went into getting Germany back on its feet would be undone when the Great Depression struck. Since Germany had been receiving loans from the United States, its economy was tied to the fate of the American economy. Once the Depression started and the U.S. began to crumble, the ripple effects fanned out globally and hit Germany hard. Unemployment rose to 6 million in 1932, national production was down 44%, and the government tried to save money 
by cutting social services just at the moment when ordinary people needed them the most. All of the anxiety and anger resurfaced and was taken advantage of by extremist groups, none more successfully than Adolf Hitler's Nazis. While living in Austria, Hitler was drawn to politicians who were anti-communist, anti-Semitic, and talked about creating a single German state for German people run by German people. After serving in World War I, he joined the small German Workers' Party, quickly working his way to a leadership position. In November of 1923, Hitler and his followers attempted to seize power by overthrowing the Weimar Republic. Their plan failed, and Hitler was imprisoned. It was during his short stint in prison that Hitler dictated his work Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, outlining his hatred of Jews, communists, socialists, and laying out conspiratorial beliefs, such as his contention that the stabbed-in-the-back myth was true. After being released in 1924, remember, his attempt to overthrow the government happened just the previous year. Hitler returned to his party and began organizing. Through most of the 1920s, the Nazis did poorly in elections, but the problems of the latter part of the decade made them more popular. Nazis attacked the Weimar Republic as being weak and ineffectual. They attacked the very idea of democracy, arguing that it wasted precious time trying to gain consensus. They attacked liberalism. They attacked socialism. They attacked communism. In speeches, Hitler railed against the Treaty of Versailles and the, quote, traitors that had signed it. He blamed internal enemies, as well as Great Britain, France, and the United States, for virtually all of Germany's problems. Hitler took advantage of allies in the newspaper business to portray Nazis as being physically attacked and beaten by communists, when in fact the opposite was the case. It was the Nazis who were doing the assaulting. This constant demagoguery worked. In 1932, Hitler ran for president and received 37% of the vote. It was not enough to win, but it was enough to make a strong statement about which party was ascendant in German politics. Later on in 1932, during elections for parliament, the Nazis won 37% of the seats, meaning no coalition could be formed without their support. The president, Paul von Hindenburg named Hitler chancellor in 1933, making him essentially the second most powerful man in the country. Hindenburg, like Italy's Victor Emmanuel III, thought by bringing Hitler into the fold, he could control him and co-opt the Nazi movement. However, a fire in the German parliament building upset those plans. Hitler issued an emergency decree suspending civil rights. Parliament was dissolved, and new elections were held that put the Nazis in total control. The Enabling Act was passed, suspending the German constitution for four years and allowing Nazi laws to take immediate effect without parliamentary approval. Hitler, like Mussolini, had achieved complete control of the government, and would quickly begin building the organs of the new Nazi state. Any opposition to the Nazis was either outlawed and hunted down or co-opted into the organization. Though on the surface the regime seemed to be running smoothly, internally chaos reigned, as various officials and departments competed against one another for Hitler's attention and approval. Some historians argue this was by design, as it gave Hitler an even greater aura of authority. One branch of the Nazi movement 
that had been around since quite early in the party's evolution was the SA, which was in charge of enforcing discipline among party members. This was a popular branch that grew to two million members. However, more conservative elements of the Nazi movement worried about the power and fanaticism of this organization and convinced Hitler something needed to be done about it. On June 30th, 1934, the Night of Long Knives, more than a thousand SA officers were brutally murdered. Hitler publicly justified the killings by accusing the SA of corruption and its leaders of being homosexuals. Far from being appalled at such a move, many Nazis celebrated Hitler's bold steps to protect them from, quote, immorality. The Night of Long Knives was carried out by the SS, an organization that dealt with both internal and external enemies of the regime. The SS was responsible for building prison and later concentration camps for those deemed dangerous to the Nazis. They also utilized the secret police, called the Gestapo, to infiltrate and intimidate. The Nazis were able to get away with such abusive tactics by playing on the fears of their own people, fears both recent and long-standing. As mentioned earlier, Hitler used every opportunity to attack the Treaty of Versailles and the Paris Peace Conference for what he perceived were humiliating terms forced upon Germany. He spoke at length that other nations were simply trying to keep the naturally superior Aryans down, and it was every German's responsibility to support the Nazis in their quest to make Germany the world's preeminent power. He attacked capitalism and the United States for wiping out people's savings and plunging the world into the Great Depression. He also spoke to more deeply ingrained fears and prejudices. Anti-Semitism was not unique to Germany in the 1920s and 1930s. Many nations were suspicious of Jews, and hatred of the Jewish people went back literally centuries. Though the Nazis did not invent anti-Semitism, they were unique in the sheer venom directed towards the Jewish population, not just of Germany, but of the world. Everything bad that had happened to Germany was the result of Jewish conspiracies and manipulation, according to the Nazis. Nazi propaganda depicted Jews as not even really human, but, quote, vermin that needed to be, quote, exterminated. Attacking the Jewish people also became a means of attacking capitalism and all things modern. Jews were depicted as not respecting others' traditions and customs. They were depicted as at the heart of a global cabal bent on worldwide economic domination. Thus, Jews became a stand-in for criticism of the modern world and its, to the Nazis, perverted values. They also became a stand-in for the type of capitalism practiced in the United States. One of the biggest differences between the Nazis and the Italian fascists was that the Nazis viewed the world through a distinctly racial lens. They created a hierarchy of what they called, quote, races, with pure-blooded Germans at the top, of course. The other Nordic, quote, races came next, as they looked very much like pure-blooded Germans. Then came the other peoples of Western Europe, like the French and Spanish. Slavic peoples, like the Russians, were meant to be no more than slaves, while Africans, Asians, Americans, and other non-European, quote, races rounded out the bottom of the hierarchy. Jews, as subhumans in Nazi eyes, were not even in the hierarchy of human, quote, races. The Nazis were big believers in social Darwinism, which, if you'll recall from a previous lesson, 
argued that some people were better adapted, better evolved to survive, than were others. Of course, to the Nazis, they were the most fit. Everyone else was a distant second. They employed various pseudoscientific techniques to try and prove their theories, and used the ideas of eugenics to try and prevent those they deemed inferior from reproducing. Sterilization and the murder of those with physical and mental disabilities were part of the Nazi drive to engineer a better humanity. The Nazis also enshrined their racial beliefs into laws. The Nuremberg Laws stripped German Jews of citizenship and prohibited Germans from marrying Jews, among other things. Soon, Jews were legally required to wear special identifying badges. Then they were forced into ghettos to separate them from the rest of the population. All of this is before we even get into the Holocaust, which we'll talk about in the next presentation. Jewish businesses were targeted for boycotts. Jews were harassed in their daily lives. And horrible reprisals were meted out if they did something the Nazis disapproved of. For example, in response to the death of a Nazi soldier, in late 1938, some 7,500 Jewish stores were attacked, as were hundreds of synagogues. Nearly 100 Jews were killed in what is now known as the Night of Broken Glass. Many of these laws and discriminatory claims, much of this violence, was excused by members and supporters of the Nazi party, as well as many ordinary Germans. The terms Nazi and German, it should be noted, are not synonymous, as not all Germans were Nazis, and not all Nazis were Germans. Much of this discrimination was excused because Hitler had created an economic miracle in Germany. Using a combination of public works projects paid for through state contracts granted to various corporations and the process of secretly beginning to rearm, the Nazis effectively reduced the unemployment rate from roughly 6 million to less than 200,000. At a time when the Western democracies were still struggling, the United States saw its unemployment jump from 7 to 11 million during this time. What Hitler and the Nazis were accomplishing gave many the impression that perhaps Hitler was right. Perhaps democracy's time was over, and more countries should move towards authoritarianism. Speaking of democracy, it's time we move further west and take a look at what was happening in Great Britain, France, and the United States while Russia, Italy, and Germany were sliding into dictatorship. Domestically, the three democracies were extending rights to more people. Women received the right to vote in both Great Britain and the United States during the period between the World Wars. However, these extensions highlighted the others who were not being granted rights. In France, for example, women had to wait until 1945 to secure the right to vote, while in the United States, black Americans still could not vote. While simultaneously expanding their democracies at home, if slowly, Abroad, each of these nations maintained worldwide empires that denied rights to millions of natives. We've already seen in the previous lesson how both Great Britain and France enlarged their empires through the mandate system established by the Paris Peace Conference. The United States was involved in the imperial game as well, securing control of the Philippines and Guam, and getting involved in matters in many Central American countries. One consequence of having these expansive empires was immigration. People from non-European countries began moving to Great Britain, France, and the U.S. in larger numbers during this time. 
The movement was reflected in the growth of much more diverse port cities, where many immigrants settled to work. In the immediate aftermath of the First World War, both Great Britain and France tried to artificially keep prices for industrial goods low as a means of sparking demand for such products. This had the unfortunate effect of suppressing wages for industrial workers, leading to strikes and increased tension between economic classes. In the U.S., conservative presidential administrations in the 1920s pushed more conservative agendas, with economic policies shaped by the heads of the nation's largest companies. Conservative control of the Supreme Court ensured that any liberal legislation passed in Congress would be nullified. In all three countries, the, quote, Roaring Twenties seemed to be a time of peace, prosperity, and normalcy. However, trouble was quickly approaching. A general drop in agricultural prices in Europe due to overproduction was the first in a series of steps that would lead to the Great Depression. To try and protect their own crop prices, nations began putting up trade barriers with the hopes of stimulating domestic demand for domestic products. But such moves only worsened the situation. By the 1920s, an economic cycle had developed between industrialized cities and the rural farmland. Farmers in the country produced food that they sold to people living in cities, who did not farm but still needed food. In turn, the money farmers earned through selling food was used to purchase industrial products made in cities products farmers wanted or needed, but did not manufacture themselves. Once agricultural prices began to decline, farmers had less money, which meant they purchased fewer industrial products. They also, as a means of trying to maintain financial solvency, laid off workers, who then also could not afford industrial products. With fewer people purchasing industrial products, companies operating in cities saw their profits begin to decline, leading them to lay off workers as a means of saving money. This meant fewer city dwellers had the money to keep purchasing food from farmers, beginning the cycle again. These problems would continue to grow until October 1929, when the U.S. stock market crashed. Over the next three years, the value of the stock traded in the exchange would drop by 90%, leading companies to shut their doors and unemployment to skyrocket. The first American stock exchange was founded in 1774, so buying and selling stock was nothing new. What was new was the number of people getting involved. When you buy stock in a company, and that company does well, the value of your stock increases, meaning you can then sell it for a profit. If the company does badly, the value of the stock decreases, and if you sell it, you'll lose money. Once people began losing their jobs, they began selling stock to try and make some cash. With everyone selling stock and no one buying it, the value of the stock fell rapidly meaning those who did not sell early found themselves losing money on their stock. Companies that relied on selling stock for infusions of immediate capital to expand operations and hire workers began shutting down their operations and firing workers, which only exacerbated the problem by reinforcing the cycle. Since the U.S. was tied into Europe through loans it had made to the Allies during World War I and to Germany through the Dawes Plan in 1924, the Depression caused ripple effects that spread worldwide. Bank failures became endemic, businesses collapsed, and unemployment rose to unheard-of levels. In the U.S. alone, 13 million people were unemployed in 1933 while production was down 47%. Mm -hmm. 
Many nations feared letting the government get involved to help the economy. They tried other tactics like tariffs, but nothing they did helped. In fact, some of the things they tried made the economic situation worse. Eventually, most governments began stepping in to try and alleviate the Great Depression. The U.S. and Great Britain both moved off the gold standard, meaning the value of their paper currency was no longer tied to the price of gold. In France, Socialist President Leon Blum led a coalition of socialists, liberals, and communists that blocked the French Nazi Party from obtaining office. Blum's administration introduced the 40-hour work week, two weeks of paid vacation for workers, and gave them the right to collectively bargain against their employer. Conservatives in France were appalled by these measures, with one saying, quote, better Hitler than Blum, which today sounds like a short-sighted and very odd statement. It hasn't aged well, as the kids say these days. In the U.S., the Great Depression led to the election of Franklin D. Roosevelt, whose administration oversaw the passage of the New Deal, a slew of programs meant to combat both the Great Depression and extremist political parties, such as the American Nazi Party. Some examples of New Deal programs were the Tennessee Valley Authority, tasked with bringing indoor plumbing and electricity to Appalachia. The Civil Conservation Corps, tasked with improving and maintaining public parks. And the Works Progress Administration, which employed millions of Americans in every conceivable task to give them a job with a paycheck. In 1935, Social Security was introduced, with payments to help defer the costs of child care and for the disabled. Leaders like Blum and Roosevelt were keenly aware that economic malaise allows political extremism to take root and grow, and that if you wanted to stave off such extremists, like the Nazis, the economy needed to be fixed. Roosevelt hosted a series of radio addresses called Fireside Chats, in which he spoke of the power of democracy to get through trying times, and that if Americans worked together, they would get through tough economic circumstances. It was quite the different message from that delivered by men like Mussolini and Hitler. The Great Depression would prove to be a watershed moment in Western history, as many of the programs implemented during the Great Depression era would endure for decades. Another watershed moment was on the horizon as well, for in a few short years, the world would once again find itself plunged into a catastrophic war. That does it for our look at the interwar period. Today, we looked at the rise of Stalin in Russia, Mussolini in Italy, and Hitler in Germany. We also took a look at what was happening in democratic nations like the U.S. and what prompted the Great Depression. If you have any questions about this lesson, please leave a comment below or email me if you're a student. If you'd like more information on the topics covered in today's presentation, here's a short list of books you can check out to get started. Also, please like and share this video and subscribe to my channel. Lastly, I'd prefer not to see vile arguments in my comment section, so keep it clean and respectful, please. Thanks for watching, everyone, and I'll see you all again soon.